Stanford University. We are going to uh, begin. Um, and uh, uh, most of you uh, met Don Garcia. I want to introduce Chrissy Clark, um, who is going to be a fellow next year. She's a reporter at American Public Media. There's a biographical sketch of her in the program. Um, but she will be a, a fellow next year, and I think exemplifies the changes we're making. What we wanted to do is to, is to run through quickly sort of what we've done, uh, why we did it, and what, what the next steps are. Um, Len mentioned that uh, when, you know, 2005, um, that uh, when, when last we met, uh, they, that they, the ground was beginning to shift. And it really actually shifted very starkly uh, in the fall of 2005. Uh, and this is the um, example I will give, that um, we had that year, in 2005, 2006, we had uh, seven fellows from US daily newspapers. Um, these are people who had uh, done the standard thing that, that most of us did, which was got a leave of absence from our newspaper. Um, and uh, we had a study plan that was going to you know, fit with our career. We were going to go back to that newspaper. So of those seven uh, US newspaper journalists, uh, five were offered buyouts during the year. And two had their papers sold from out from under them, it sold twice, in fact, because uh, Knight Ritter uh, was sold to McClatchy, and then the two people at those papers, um, uh, those papers were sold to, the people were not sold, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> although it felt like that, I'm sure. <laughs> they were sold to, to uh, Dean Singleton. Neither of those things had ever happened before, not in the 40 years of the program. And we looked and we said, the, the, the model we've been operating on, which is that people come from mainstream news organizations, established news organizations, and then they go back to those news organizations with a sort of implied dual loyalty, that we couldn't rely on that model going forward alone. That would still happen in some cases, but it was not going to happen across the board. And so we, what, what we decided, and this was Don, me, our board of visitors, is that we wanted to figure out what should the Knight Fellowships become over the next few years? What should it look like in five years? Um, and we, we uh, created a, um, a strategic plan task force, which consisted of three former fellows, uh, three journalists um, who were not affiliated with the Knight Fellowship Program, because we wanted to make sure we got outside um, you know, eyes on this, uh, four members of our board of visitors, and two Stanford faculty members. Um, and it met several times, did research, uh, interviewed people about what, 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 what the potential roles were, um, and, um, gener and, and finally came to uh, the conclusion that we ought to focus uh, on journalism, innovation, entrepreneurship, and leadership, and more, um, sort of, more of a departure that, unlike um, the model that had existed for 40 years, in which people came and they were supposed not to produce anything but themselves. That is, the idea is that we would improve one, you know, we were, we were improving journalism one journalist at a time. People would go out and do markedly better work, was that we ought to put the creative forces of our fellows uh, to work in creating things that could improve journalism. So we would become more, instead of being focused on producing journalism, would also be focused on creating and, and, and helping journalism. So I left anything out. Yeah, well, one of the things that, um, that, we, that we've talked about in, in this whole process is also um, what would stay the same, what should stay the same. Um, we're, we were doing a lot of changes, but there are three main things that we felt then and feel now that, that need to stay the same, and that's um, that fellows would be at Stanford spending an academic year using the wonderful resources of Stanford. It's a, it's a terrific place. It's an intellectual smorgasbord. It's a place where you can expand your mind in ways you didn't know you were interested in. Um, the art of Rodin for myself, um, painting for Bobby. I mean, it's all these things that come to you that then change your life and be, make you a better person and a better journalist, that that would continue. We really want that to continue. Um, Secondly, that fellows would be responsible for their, for their own agenda. They would set their own agenda. This, this will continue. Uh, we're not going to set the agenda for them. They'll come with their great idea and work on their great idea. 
And um, the third thing would be that fellows, fellowship, what you're experiencing right now this weekend, uh, would continue, which is the interaction between fellows. I learned probably more from the international fellows in my class than, than anything during my year. And I think that we really want that to continue. So that's one of the things that we wanted to have continue. Um, what would change, as Jim mentioned, was our focus, which would be on innovation, entrepreneurship, and leadership that we want to help make a difference in journalism. Uh, and given that, that people are going to come out at the end of their year with something to show for their year. Um, we've been very vague on purpose about that. And uh, people, when they were applying last year, said, you know, what do you want? We said, come with a great idea. And we got some great ideas. Um, if you see the list of fellows, including Chrissy, whose ideas are on the list for next year, we have some great ideas. Um, we also really wanted to expand the range of people that we thought would be a great fellow. Um, we were pretty strict in the past on this is mid-career, this is you had to have seven years down to the month of experience. Um, and now we're saying, you know, you could have a great idea and be, as we did have in our finalist pool, someone who was 66 and someone who was 29. <laughs> And so we're not taking people, say, right out of college, but it could be somebody younger than we've thought of in the past and somebody older than we've thought of, frankly, in the past, and more experienced as a great fellow. Um, the other factor was that we really wanted to focus on was international uh, focus. We have always had a focus on countries where freedom of press was challenged, um, and we really, really wanted to uh, up that and really increase our focus on countries, having fellows from countries where there's a developing press and where we can really make a difference. What am I leaving out? We, um, it was really interesting as part of the process, as many of you remember, we, um, we queried you as to what, what you thought uh, the Knight fellowship should, Knight fellowship should become. And one of the things that we heard over and over and over was use us more. Use the alumni more. Use us for the program. <coughs> use us for journalism. Use us in a way that, that where we can feel like, like we are contributing to things. So this is one of our one of the, the, the five sort of the five pillars here of this is that we're going to engage. We want to engage alumni more, not just in the program, but in solving problems. And specifically, we're thinking about in regional areas, and in, in so that we're we, we may set up some a network of of fellows um, uh, in, in Africa, in Latin America, where they can work on, they can work together on problems, challenges. So that was one. And a, a, another is that we really um, want to engage and enlist the Stanford community and the Silicon Valley community more. When, as we were, um, we were um, uh, talking with faculty members about their interactions with Knight Fellows, all, it was just across the board. Everybody said it was just wonderful. I, I loved, but it was always, I loved having Knight Fellows in my class. Um, and it was sort of, it was a, it was a, a one-off, if you will. It was not, for the most part, engaging faculty members on, on, these, on these issues. One of our goals is to engage the university more in solving these, in, in meeting these challenges in journalism. And what we have found is that um, it's, there's a lot of interest in journalism at Stanford, um, but it's like everybody's second priority. They're, they're, they have other things that they're working on more directly. And so what we want to do is try to enlist people in that. So I think that's the, that's the those are, those are the main things. I, I think, too, just coming off of the classes idea, one of the things that we've seen in the last few years, and those of you who have been fellows most recently will, will know what I mean, is there's so many more things at Stanford than classes. There's wonderful classes, and, and we really will encourage, continue to encourage people to take all the best professors and, and have that experience. But there's just, there's 100 centers at Stanford um, that are doing research in all kinds of areas that could help journalism, could help individual journalists. And so tapping into those centers, those researchers, um, things that are not just a class, which sometimes works for fellows and sometimes doesn't, is something we're very interested in, um, which is actually one of the things that Chrissy is tapping into at Stanford. Yeah. Um, just so. We, 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 we made this announcement in November, um, and we were, as, as Don said, we were very curious to see what would have. We, we had really no idea what would happen in the application process. I, I considered it very possible that we would, 
go have a steep drop, or that we'd have a steep increase. And what we had, in fact, was a steep increase. We had ended up with 298 applications international in the U.S., which is the most ever, including 166 uh, U.S. applications. Um, the year before, it was 88. Uh, um, <clears throat> some of that is due to the economy. But uh, we, we, we went through, we figured about one out of five um, of the people who applied for a U.S. fellowship um, either wouldn't have applied be uh, before, sometimes because they said, I wouldn't have applied before, <laughs> uh, or else we could look at them and say, you know, we, wouldn't, uh, we, we don't think they would have applied, or we wouldn't have taken them seriously because they were too young, too old, they were too much of an outlier, um, too, uh, just too, too not in our model. So it's about one out of five. Um, we also noticed, and I wrote about this on the, the blog that I started doing, we also noticed there was a, a huge number of people who had either lost their job, just lost their jobs in the last few months or were about to, including a, a really disheartening number of a very experienced foreign correspondents for major news organizations. And one of them, in fact, Andrew Purvis, uh, will be a fellow next year. He, he'd been, he was the Berlin bureau chief for Time magazine, and in, I think it was during the application process that his job ended. So we've, uh, so we've, we've, we've selected the fellows, and you, you see that, they're, that it's a, quite an interesting uh, range. There's only two from US, two US yellows from US fellows from daily newspapers. We have two people who, describe, who are consultants, although they have journalism backgrounds. Um, and now we're, this summer we're in the process, once this reunion is finished, of, um, of uh, creating a network of mentors for them who will work on their proposals. So the, uh, this is part of, the, uh, of uh, the, the plan to engage Stanford and Silicon Valley. We have informal commitments from people that we know, at, both at Yahoo and Google, to help on sort of technical aspects of some of this. And we're, say we're really excited about this. Um, we're, uh, we had our board meeting about a month ago, and, and uh, one of our board members, in, in, who was enthusiastic about this, says it feels like we're going back on offense. Uh, and that's how we think about it, too, which is like instead of just being defensive, we're going back on offense. Can you take a question on that right now? Sure. But, but, uh, uh, actually, I'd, I'd like to have Chris, but then I'll, I'll try to. So uh, Chrissy Clark. Um, uh, is uh, was a reporter at American Public Media, um, and um, she actually found her own mentor before she even started applying. But I, she, I would like her to talk, I'd like you to talk, just a, a little bit about um, you know how you uh, how you came to apply for the fellowship and what you hope to accomplish and how it will how it will help journalists. <laughs> and though I uh, am one of the members of the first class under this new innovation. Uh, charge, I won't be Twittering you. I'll actually be talking to you <laughs> in, with my real voice. Um, so my name is Chrissy Clark, and I'm a public radio reporter, which explains why I'm reading off of these notes, because I'm not used to actually seeing the people that I talk to. I, I want to make sure that I don't get distracted by all these faces. Um, I've been working in public radio for about 10 years now, doing features and documentaries. Most recently, I've been at American Public Media reporting for the business show Marketplace, if you're familiar with that. Um, I also just finished a radio documentary that aired nationally on NPR stations about Las Vegas and its recent distinction as uh, the foreclosure capital of the United States. Um, and John and, Dim, J Don and Jim asked me here today as a member of the incoming class to talk about the focus of the project that I'll be working on. Um, so I'm interested in exploring geographically aware journalism, which is kind of a mouthful, and I will explain what I mean by that now. Um, so first I want to start with the inspiration for, for this idea. It's rooted deep in my approach to journalism, and it came to sort of a culmination, as all good inspiration should, from a vision I had in the desert, and I'll get to that vision in a second. <laughs> But first, the roots of this. Um, I've long believed that the best journalism is like a map. It shows where you are in relation to other people, and it provides a sense of topography and kind of the best path forward. Whatever a job of piece of journalism is doing, whether it's breaking a story or investigating corruption or giving voice to voice the voiceless, I think if the job is done well, you'll be shown a new world or gain understanding of a familiar world. Effective stories help citizens and communities discover where they are and where they might be going. 
And on a more literal level, I also love maps. I grew up in the Bay Area, and my family has been here for several generations. And when I was a kid, I used to go on a lot of drives with my dad, and he would hand me a map and say, take us somewhere. And then he would point out the window at things that he tell stories about our family as we went. And this was sort of how I was, how I became a journalist, because I, I realized that a landscape is made of all of these stories of the people who live there. And the people shape the land, and the land shapes the people, um, sort of like geologic strata. Um, and so I just skipped a page one second. <laughs> There we go. Um, and so that relationship between people and place is something that's always informed my journalism. It's actually something that um, in one of my first reporting jobs at High Country News, which has been run by uh, Ed and Betsy Marston, who are over here in the audience, um, it's an environmental newspaper and was a radio show for a while um, that I worked on. And they were very, that was sort of the mandate there, was to think about the relationship between people and place. Um, some of the favorite stories that I've told in the course of my reporting at High Country News and beyond um, are sort of looking at a place and asking, why is it like this? Why, how did it get to be like this? So I've done stories about why San Francisco is a gay-friendly city. Like, what, what, what is that all about? Why, out of all of the places in America, is it San Francisco? And it turns out it actually has a lot to do with the way that bars were regulated in, at the turn of the century. And you can ask me more about that later if you want. Um, but so, um, so that's the kind of journalism I like to do. And then I was driving through the desert a few years ago. And I was really hot, and I was kind of hallucinating. And I, um, and I saw this house off in the distance. And it was in a really desolate part of Utah. And I had this urge. I kept wondering, like, what, what is that house doing? And why is somebody living out in the middle of nowhere? And I had this urge. It was kind of the beginning of the internet age. I wanted to click on the house, like sort of reach out and like <laughs> click on it, like you do some, a hyperlink in a computer. And of course, this was impossible. The world is not made out of hyperlinks. You can't click on things to learn more about them. At least you couldn't. But now we have these things. Where is mine? I brought my prop here. I just bought my, my iPhone. <laughs> and we have these gadgets that actually know the exact coordinates of where you are at any given point, any given place. And they are connected to the internet, and they can tell you things about the place that you are. And right now, you can get news just sort of about the world that's not necessarily rooted to where you happen to be standing, or you can get information about what's going on right around you. You can get restaurant reviews. You can find out the names of the mountains near you. You can read little encyclopedia entries or wiki entries about the landmarks you might see. And I think that's all really cool, but the world and what we need to know about the world is more than encyclopedia entries and restaurant reviews and, and facts about the names of things. There's actually the human dramas, the hopes and the concerns of the people who live in a place, the forces that shape that place the government policies that shape that place. And I think that in a world where we are hearing a lot of bad news about journalism, this is really good news. The fact that we have these gadgets, but they aren't necessarily telling us the most meaningful things about the world that we live in. I think every place has a thousand stories that help us understand our world. And as journalists, we tell these stories every day. But there could be more efficient and effective and creative ways of bringing those stories, kind of aggregating those stories to the place where we're standing. Um, and so I had this thought that what if reporters in newsrooms could actually geotag their stories in a coordinated way so that when somebody goes to a, particularly, a particular place in the world or looks at a map of a place, they can get an aggregate of the information about it, the stories that journalists have written about it. Imagine if you actually could take your iPhone and point it at a house in a desert or a strawberry field you're driving by and find out about the people who live in it or work in it or, or find out all of the resources that we journalists have about this place. So in my year at Stanford, I want to explore how journalism can take advantage of these mapping technologies and GPS gadgets. And I think that they'll be able to help us spot patterns and see issues develop. I think they'll help us be able to tell rich, richer stories, connect with audiences in new ways, and a big one right now, develop new sources of revenue. Because there are sort of interesting ways of creating location-aware advertising that maybe can help us survive. 
Um, so I want to create tools that will harness this fleeting but powerful investment in the curiosity that you have in a place when you're actually physically standing in it. And the resources, the resources at Stanford and neighboring Silicon Valley are a goldmine for this sort of work. Stanford's Bill Lane Center for the Study of the North American West and particularly its Spatial History Project are already bringing together scholars in the humanities who are using mapping technology in their research. And in fact, the project's associate director, who I think might also be in the audience right now, John Christensen, oh, John, there he is, um, who is also a former Knight Fellow, um, it has been a huge help. When I first thought that I wanted to do a project like this and Stanford might be an interesting place to do it, I called him up. And he's been wonderfully supportive of this idea and brainstormed with me. And I'm really looking forward to working with him and collaborating with him um, and learning more about the technologies and approaches that the center uses. And then beyond Stanford, obviously, there's Silicon Valley and they're making all of the gadgets that we are now carrying in our pur purses and pockets more and more. And so I'm really interested in talking to them and sort of bringing a, a journalistic lens to some of the, some of the work that they're doing and, and see how we can apply it. Um, and so just specifically in closing, the, the two tangible things that I would like to come away besides being inspired and um, are I, I want to draft a research and, and some sort of white paper on this sort of journalism. It's what I've been calling geographically aware journalism. And I'll catalog the available technologies that are out there and the ways the interesting things journalists are already using with them, are doing with them, and then also consider revenue strategies, research what's possible, and then I hope to share this in an article in some industry, industry magazine or blog that can get a dialogue going about this sort of stuff in the journalism community. And then second, I want to conduct some sort of journalism experiment myself based on this sort of research. Um, it might be some sort of audio tour, because radio is the medium I work in mostly, um, of an area somewhere around Stanford, or I, I don't know quite what it will be, and, and I'm excited to, to think more about that. And I hope that my project doesn't end with the fellowship. I think this is stuff that can provide really interesting tools for journalists. And if, we're just, if it's deployed by smart and creative reporters, I think it has the power to enrich people's understanding of the world and provide insightful stories that come with an immediate built-in context, which is the place that you happen to be standing at any given point. So that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's go to questions. I really would like, to, again, to use the microphones because we're recording this and we'll be posting it. For um, Don and Jim. First of all, have you thought about how long you think your new reincarnated fellowship will last um, under that uh, model? Because I think we know, looking at technology developments, that things get really excited for a while, and there's so many new ideas, and then it's like overflow of new ideas, and then things really settle down. So I wondered if you had any idea for reinventing again in the future. And the second thing is, since you have so many people in the new class and the upcoming classes that don't have the traditional journalism background. Um, are you thinking at all that you might want to incorporate in the year some elements of traditional journalism values and practices and ethics and so forth to kind of bring that into the new generation? Or is that not part of your thought? Thank you. Let, let, yeah, let me take the first part and then let Don take the second part. Um, one of the things that we um, really um, thought about as we were planning this change is that it would be sort of a continuing examination, that we, wouldn't, we wanted not to get in a situation where we hadn't examined for some time the fundamental um, structure of the program. So our idea is that this will be indefinite, but that the way the program looks next year is likely not to be the way it looks four years from now, that we will we will see how this works. This is a, one of the real challenges for us is there's no real model for, for doing this. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is really inventing something, because there's no other fellowship program that operates this way. Uh, and we looked around Stanford, and there's, no, there's nothing really at Stanford that operates this way. So we'll, we'll, at the end of next year, we'll, we'll, we'll look and say, well, that worked pretty well. And boy, that didn't work at all. And, so that we'll make changes going forward. Our idea is that if, 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 we keep, if we do this right, if we keep examining at every stage what does journalism need from the Knight Fellowships, that, we'll, that it'll, be an it, it'll be more of an incremental process than this was. I think it'll be an evolution. That's right. Yeah. And we'll be watching. Evolution by incremental. Um, 
looking at the list of, of fellows which we've handed out to you for next year's class, actually all of them have intensive journalism experience, background, interest. So it's it's not that they there's, they look different from, from classes in the past. There's no question about that. So I don't think there's, a, there's a, a need for remedial journalism training or something like that. I think there's a need for a conversation about the bedrock values of journalism among any journalism group fellowship class. And I think we would continue to do that. I would say also that um, in my experience, and it's, I'm finished, it'll be 20 years as, as part of the, the uh, working for the Knight Fellowship Program, that the most intense and important journalism standards and practices and discussions were quite apart from anything we set up, but what went on among the fellows from different media, from different countries, from different regions, from different traditions. And that, that was, it was out of that that, that, um, uh, that, that people came, what, came with a stronger sense of, the, of journalism and what it, what it meant to them. For, for many of us, it's certainly true for me, and I think it was true for a lot of I came to Stanford on a, on, a, on a what was then called a professional journalism fellowship and got really kind of re-inspired about what was possible. And I think that, that was a key journalism value for me. I think that's going to continue to be the case. Come with a great idea. What a great idea. And, and this, in effect, is a, is a follow-up to the previous question. It's a, it's a model question. But, and it's far too early for re reflection, let alone evaluation. But at some point, and I hope you will keep us informed about the evaluation process. Can you look back and see if there was a box of great ideas, there was a shaping of great ideas, outside of which there, was, uh, there were outliers, or, or we couldn't accommodate this great idea or for financial reasons, or it's too far out? Uh, was there a shape to the great ideas collection? Certainly, Chrissy, Chrissy is one good example, but. And, and, and we can find a, a package of examples, but was there a shaping of a, a great ideas box? Do you mean a great ideas for the fellowship or for journalism? For the fellowship, for, for the way you're going, for the, in line with the yeah. previous question, the model. Yeah. And, and like I say, it's not necessarily a question you can answer now, but I hope you will be able, you will be answering it, but, but give us some ideas. I, 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 let me, let me try and answer it this way and then have Don give a crack too. I think that um, <clears throat> when, we, when we were examining what was going on in 2005 and 2006, um, and we, we um, said, we think we have to change. Um, and, but um, uh, maybe we don't have to change. That was one thing to say. Maybe, maybe, we should, maybe what we need to be is, is, um, is kind of the place, the, the, pre the preservation hall, if you will, uh, the place where we preserve certain elements of journalism. And so that we need to become even sort of more, I don't want to say more insular, but sort of like more a place that isn't engaged in all this. And, and we thought about that and, and we decided, I would have to say fairly quickly, no, that's not a good idea. Um, but then we said, uh, maybe just tweak it a little bit. And I think that, um, the key for us was that we committed early on, and I have to say we had the support of our board, we had the support of fellows, to, like, to, to radically think about what we were going to do. And we had those, these three immutables. As I, as, you know, the fellows were going to spend a year at Stanford, they were going to be the, uh, the architects of their own year, and there was going to be rich interaction among fellows. That was, we consider those to be the core elements. Beyond that, so everything else is on the table. I think, I don't know if that's a great idea, but it was, it, it, we couldn't have gotten to where we are now if we hadn't, take, if we hadn't done that. I think moving forward on the great ideas, there's going to be some great ideas that don't turn out to be great ideas. <laughs> but, yes. And that's OK. Uh, I think being in Silicon Valley is a great home for the Knight Fellowships in a place that's experimentation is key. And if you don't experiment, if you don't occasionally fail, then you don't learn, and you don't move forward, you don't grow. And I think that we're going to have, um, see how some of these ideas work out. And you know, we hope and expect that some of them will succeed fabulously, and other ones will, you'll learn a lot from them and realize that wasn't the thing you wanted to do. But so I think it's experimentation and, cons and evaluation. We're going to be watching how this turns out. We're going to be evolving. Um, 
to be, again, really a resource for journalists and journalism. There's a game which the name I've forgotten, which involves taking today's newspaper and imagine going back 25 years and which of the headlines would surprise people the most and seem the most unthinkable 25 years ago. So I was playing that with the list of people that you've chosen for next year, taking it back to my year, also your year, yes. <laughs> and going, most of us wouldn't have a clue what these people do for a living from reading their descriptions, which I find very, very exciting because one of the reasons you got into journalism was for the new and for finding out something. So I'd like to hear from Chrissy Clark. <laughs> Is journalism going to survive? And what's it going to look like in 25 years? <laughs> Your fellowship is riding on this. <laughs> Len, do you want to come back in here? <laughs> um, well, I have to say, there, a, a friend used a phrase, maybe you guys have heard it recently, called a prosumerism, which I guess is this new thing that is happening in the world where people are so excited by all of the online content that exists that they're willing to do it for free. And that's really cool on one hand, but I, I forget who it was, but that asked the question about, you know, are any of a, it, it's like having the doctors and the lawyers all of a sudden getting $15,000 salaries. And so I think there are questions I have about how, how all of the creativity and the opportunity that exists with the new ground that we're breaking right now, how that's going to be supportable financially. But I think the fundamentals remain. I mean, they're the ones that got me interested in journalism. And I think the one, we live in a world, and we want to be informed about that world. And we want to create dialogues among us to make that world better. And we just need to figure out ways to do that in a way that keeps people interested and engaged. So. Yeah, journalism is going to survive. <laughs> Oops, what? Okay. So in my year, 1984, we had to also write a plan, um, a program that we had, a proposal that we had. And it was a not at all closed secret that everybody would drop it the minute they came here. It had actually nothing to do with why you were at Stanford, and that was encouraged. Um, you studied Rodin. I took a wonderful course in creativity in the engineering department. Somebody else became a poet. But in actual fact, what you're really doing now is making a more practical model for journalism. So is there any way that you're going to ask fellows to come up with something to show that in actual fact they have been thinking about that or have dropped it and come up with something else? So yes, that's not an open secret that a lot of people had a proposal and ditched it when they got here. But or maybe did half of it or, or changed. And I think that's fine that people change. In, this, in our new focus, we are asking that fellows have something to show for the end of for their year. That's, that's the phrase we're using. Again, that's very general on purpose, because we don't want to say you are required to write a report or you are required to do x. We want what comes out of their year to be a bit more organic. And we will be excited to see what people produce at the end of their year. And it could be the beginning of something. It may not be a, a, a finished project, a finished product. And we want people to have the serendipity factor, which is what I call it. And that is the aha moments for things like painting and Rodin and golf, Bonnie Jo, wherever she is. Um, but we do want people to have something that they accomplished during their year. And we'll be working with the fellows who will have mentors to help them in that and to have some sort of regular meetings so that they can keep, have good progress on those. But again, it's, it's an expectation. And we don't, we're not using the word requirement. But. Yeah. Uh, I would, uh, we, we see that the, 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 the specific, uh, First of all, I mean, I guess I must be the only person that actually did a study plan. So, <laughs> so that's just kind of screw up I am. Um, <laughs> but um, we see the, these 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 proposals, these these journalism-oriented things that people are working on, is taking 
at a maximum about half of their time and energy during the year. And we see the other half as the kinds of things that Knight Fellows have always, and PJFs have always had available to them. Uh, classes that they, that they missed in, in college or uh, a, a chance to read things that, in a coherent way. So we don't, this is not, this is not going to become a completely project-oriented yeah. Program. It's going to have more of, a, more of a focus, but it's not going to be just that. It's not going to be 20 people off in a corner, each working on their individual projects and never talking to each other. Um, this is completely out of left field, but one of you mentioned Google and Yahoo. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any possibility, any discussion of the thought that prov uh, distributors of information on the internet such as Google and Yahoo, could become creators of journalistic information uh, since they have the expertise at using the media? Um, this comes up, um, it's come up in, in our, our conversations with people there who are at fairly high levels. And the thing that we hear back each time it comes up is, from people at Google and Yahoo, no. Uh, for the most part. We are not in the, con the content creation business. We're in the aggregation and distribution business. We do that really well. We think of all different kinds of ways to do that, but that's not what we do, and, and, and that it would, it would be very different for us to try to do that. What we are really excited about in this is, it, 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 even though, as, as you know, Google and Yahoo, Google in particular, um, are, are seen sometimes as the as as, a, as a, well the problems for for journalists. Um, there are a lot of people there at at Google and Yahoo who are very concerned about the issues that we're concerned about. Um, and what they would what they've committed to do is to devote some of their personal resources. I don't mean like their their money, but their time and energy to working with fellows as they're trying. So let's say uh, a, a, something that that Chrissy's trying to work out that needs some particular uh, element of technology, or there's something about Google Maps that you can, in some way you can do an app or a widget that works for that. Um, and, and they really do want to become more useful to journalists in that way. So that's, the, that's, the, that's what I see is happening. Yahoo has done some uh, news creation. They had uh, Kevin Seitz. Um, uh, hot zone. Hot zone. Yep. Um, the, the Yahoo Sports uh, regularly breaks uh, important uh, uh, investigative stories, but for the most part, they're they're going to be more, I, I think, uh, aggregators and distributors. Um, I want to say one other thing, and then we're going to break for coffee. Which? Cool. Oh, sure. I'm On sorry. that question. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, I just. I just wonder, though, do you sense any willingness to go further from Google and Yahoo? Because I think. I mean, I snidely said they're, when you said they're not in the content creation business, I said, no, they're in the content ripping off business. But, the, uh, but, but I mean, more seriously, I just wonder, cable television created C-SPAN as kind of its public service give back. Um, what about these internet providers? I mean, you're close to them, so I just wonder, do they, is there any sense that they ought to give something back? And wouldn't it be great, since there's been such a devastation in the news business that that give back take the form of some news support for, for journalism. There, we've been, there have been discussions with Google in particular about some things along this line. It has not gone anywhere, but, uh, but I think there's, there, there may be some, they may be open to it. Um, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a, an authority on cable television, but I don't think Comcast created C-SPAN, Brian Lamb created C-SPAN, uh, and, and. Yeah, but they provide the money for it. Um, That's yeah okay. Well, they but isn't it true that they they provide the money, but then then they charge for it as well, right? They charge into you know the, the cable distributors charge for that, right? I don't think so, right. but I don't I'm know. I don't know the head. answer okay. to that question. I'm, I, um, I, I think it's more of um, I, I I see more that that um, I, anyway. I don't see Google doing that specifically with a wide range. I think they might experiment, uh, Yahoo as well. So. Okay. Um, the thing I want to say, the, what we, uh, one of the, 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 the premises of the fellows work on is that it, to make it useful to everybody is that we plan to publish all of it on our website. And, and uh, our goal in all of these 
is that each, uh, whatever people are working on, um, be replicable, that is, it can be used by others, scalable, it can be used in small or large, uh, um, small or large operations, and it'll be open source. Um, and one of our goals is to make our website a, a gathering place for, for these kinds of, of issues and people who are interested in it. So thank you. Uh, we're going to take about a 20-minute coffee break, and then we'll be back here at about 11 o'clock. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.